there is no solution, that's wrong. You have to take the rulers, slide it down again, create the new menu, just keep doing it until you find it to the way it does. Okay, so the bomber stopped. Now that's very important in the war, because if the bomb stops, it means the menus are probably right. An incorrect menu very rarely had a solution, right? <coughs> when it stops, the information it gives is in a little thing called the letterbox around there, because it looks like a letterbox. A uh, little metal pin is two pieces of information. The first is it says which bank caused the stop. It's pointing at this bank, of course, it's anyone that can load it up. But in the war, to run this menu fully, you run it on 20 bombs, all right? Because each bomb can test three of the permutations of those rotors, okay? One on this bank, one on this bank, one on this bank. So if you run 20 bombs, you're testing every possible permutation of those three. So one of them has to be the right one. Great. Okay? So the one that causes the stop is almost certainly the correct three rotors in the correct order, the first part of the key of the day. Okay? The second thing it's pointing out is a letter, and it's pointing at the letter D. And the logic circuit of the bomb is saying one of the ten Stecker pairs has to be D connected to my input letter G on my menu. All right? Now, everything's hanging together here. What they discovered, though, was that even a menu as good as this stops four times. Now, that can't be right. You cannot have four message settings, okay? So three of them are just down to random chance. So they have to invent another machine to do what we call check the stops. There's two round the back there. This is what they look like. And basically, it's a Letchworth Enigma lying on its side, but they've wired in the keyboard of an Enigma to it, okay? So the girl who ran this machine, she sat here. As soon as the bomb stopped, she'd ask the bomb operator, tell me the details of the stop. Which rotors, which drums to put on, what the message setting was that the bomb thinks works, SNY, she'll set them to SNY. What the letter is, that letter D, so she can press the D, make sure the G lights up, because that's the stecker pair the bomb says works. But her real test is to then take the menu, and press each letter of the menu and note down the potential stecker pair for that letter, okay? If it's the correct stop, she will get all the way around with no contradiction, all right? Incorrect stops, it will get, like the first one, when she gets to the R, it will light up and say R is connected to two letters as a stecker, which is physically impossible, there's only one into a little wire. Um, so, by the time they get to the, the correct one, it's typically, on a typical day, it'll be five o'clock in the morning, all right? So the bomb's done its bit, so the mathematicians would take the key of the day and say, right, what do we know? Well, we know which three rotors it was, and we know the order of them, because the bomb's told us on the bank that caused the stop, okay? We know all ten Stecker pairs, because on the checking machine, she went all the way around without any contradiction. We don't know ABD, or the message setting direct, but it has a direct mathematical relationship to the message setting the bomb's discovered. Okay? You can calculate it without too much trouble. What you're left with is the ring down, the alphabetical rings. Because when you change them, you pull out the pin, you're not moving any wiring, so the bomb can't find it directly. So you have to infer it mathematically. Okay? But you're in that happy position, more knowns than unknowns. Now if you think back to your maths days, which is longer for some of us than others, more knowns than unknowns means you can use simultaneous equations to solve for the unknowns. Okay? It's based on that, it's not quite that, but it's based on that. So five o'clock in the morning, the mathematicians would take the menu, the output of the bomb, disappear off to one of us and give it a go, all right? Now, if the menu was weak, sometimes they'd come back and say, we can't do it, not in the time available, but they did manage to do it nearly 25,000 times, 25,000 keys of the day were recovered here. That meant about three and a half million messages were deciphered. Okay? Wow. So, if they, if they succeeded, they'd come back after two or three hours, and they'd say, we have it. We have the one setting that had been used that day out of the 158 million trillion settings, and it's 8 o'clock in the morning, all right? So Hitler was very badly advised to rely on this machine. You can break into it with the right brain power, the right processes, and the right dedication of everybody involved in the whole process, okay? So you take your Enigma machine, you load the key of the day on it, and you type in the cipher text, starting with the S, one letter at a time. What lights up one letter at a time, of course, is better for us, Saga. That's the confirmation, it's the correct key of the day, all right? 
That means that for that 24 hour period, you can decipher all German messages sent on that radio network. There's 50 radio networks to do, okay? And at midnight, it's grand old day, the whole thing starts again, right? Brad and the other day. Now, there are one last problem, it's called the volume problem, and the reason I emphasize one letter at a time. Churchill being Churchill, he demanded Bletchley Park de uh, decipher thousands of messages every day. By 1942, he was asking for 10,000 messages a day. On D-Day, 18,000 messages. You haven't a hope of even doing a tiny fraction, one letter at a time on the Enigma machine, okay? So they have to come up with a solution. That's the solution in the corner there. It's called Type-X. Type-X is the British version of Enigma, built by the British government using identical technology, but built with five rotors, okay? Now, a five rotor machine was almost certainly unbroken in the Second World War. You can't run a bomb type machine fast enough and accurately enough to break that machine. So, what they did was they took 200 of these Type X machines, they modified them, like this one here, so it only runs with three rotors. You load the key of the day on it, and you sit another young girl in front of it who can type with 10 fingers. Okay? Now, because this is an electric typewriter based machine, she could type at around about 20 words a minute, even though she was only typing in ciphertext. Okay? This was a really hard job there's no words here, it's unconnected letter string, really hard to get, um, get right. But because she was typing it so fast, what we discovered was that Bletchley Park was reading the messages before the German officer that it had been sent to. Because his Enigma operator is sat down a muddy hole going one letter at a time. So there was an interval between them, during which, if you were quick, you could do something about it, because you knew what his action was going to be. All right? <coughs> so, what was typed in was captured on the left-hand paper tape, on the right-hand paper tape is where you saw the plain German for the first time. Now that needed further processing by the linguists, but they were clear what the message was. It was typed out in English, those were the ultra decodes you've heard of, okay? Those ultra decodes went to the three leaders of the armed forces <coughs> with two caveats. The first was you read it, you destroy it. You are not allowed to keep it because you have to preserve the secret that Enigma had been broken at all costs. As Hitler was on record as saying, if one could prove to him that we'd broken it, that the Allies had broken it, he was prepared to change the machine. Every machine. A huge undertaking. But if he'd done it, that would have been the end for the Allies. A simple change to Enigma would have stopped the bomb working. You know? So, those ultra decodes had to be treated very carefully, and I'm sure you know there was a lot of discussion about some of the things that Bletchley Park told the government were going to happen, and they had to let it happen because they couldn't come up with a plausible cover story and that would have been the print and that would have been the end of us. Right? But the ultra decodes are really what swung the war. So if you sum it all up, you know, Bletchley, uh, Park, cheering the bomb and the ultra decodes, the official view is it shortened the war by two years. There were seven million people being killed a year at that time. That's 14 million people Bletchley saved. But equally as important, Sir Harry Hinsley, historian cryptologist, he was here in the war, he wrote his own analysis, and he shows it's actually more like four years it shortened the war by, and he hints at what is probably the truth, that it really did make the difference in winning or losing the war. So thank you very much for listening.